last week Bryce used one of my favorite analogies with missions. It's uh, that of us holding the rope. I think it was William Carey writing to, or maybe he's talking to Robert Fuller. He was saying, I'll be willing to go down the mission to hold the rope. I was just thinking of our role, you know, our role of not only praying for missionaries, which I hope that we all do consistently, but also that willingness to give financially to support them as a sacrifice. I know a couple years ago, my wife and I had to really um, think about, are we giving sacrificially, you know, so that it's, uh, you know, we can feel it. I don't know, you, you do whatever you have to do, but I was thinking for us, that's what we wanted to do. And I was thinking, you know, this is an area that I can always grow in. Let's stand this morning, let's sing the, to this about asking the Lord to grow.
to the joy and light of thy home, Jesus, I come to thee. Out of the depths of ruin untold, into the peace of thy sheltering fold, ever thy glory a space to behold, Jesus, I come to thee. Jesus, I come.
Jesus promised that there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. What surprises us in that promise of Jesus is that in this time, certainly we believe that anyone who for the sake of the gospel has to surrender up their social relationships or their families who disown them because of believing in the Christ, certainly we believe that they will in the age to come receive eternal life. No problem there. But Jesus, before he says that, says this, anyone who does that will receive many more times what they've lost in this time, meaning in this life. What does that mean? How does the saint who's setting off from this worldly city on his pilgrimage to the celestial city, how does he, in leaving behind so many relationships and suffering so much sacrifice, receive many times more than what he left behind him even before he gets there? I think Jesus himself answered this on another occasion when he was sitting in a house and you remember that his mother and his brothers, biological mother and brothers on earth, they came and they wanted to see Jesus but there was a massive crowd around him in the house. So they send word, your mother and brothers are outside and Jesus' response is, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. In that moment, Jesus redefined family for all of us. Jesus is not denying that you have a biological family. We're not denying that. And if that's a good relationship, that's a rich blessing. There's no denial of that. And yet the most essential family that you have is not your biological family. It is your family in Christ. Those who hear the word of God and do it. All genuine believers the world over form one large family. That is why to enter into this family, you may have to suffer the loss of your earthly family. That's what Jesus is saying. Or your earthly house. And this has been true for Christians throughout two millennia, and it's true for Christians in parts of the world today. But what Jesus is saying is that when you leave your earthly family, or they leave you, then you enter into a family much larger with many, many more houses, more brothers, more sisters, more mothers, more fathers. You enter into the universal family of God, which is all who truly trust in Christ. The Muslim who submits to Christ may lose his family's support or even secure his family's hatred. But having lost one set of parents he gains tens of thousands. That Muslim man now, if he travels to any part of the entire world, can find a set of parents in the Lord, older believers who will welcome him into their house. He gains a house. Welcome him as a member of their family. Here at Faith Bible Church, we are a family in the truest sense of that term. I don't mean that like, here's your real family, biological, and we're just a shadow of that. I mean it, the reverse of that. We are a family in the most fundamental sense. And then our earthly family is a shadow of that. I'm not now saying to you, be a family. I'm just telling you what's already true. I'm telling you that you are a family, that this is the way Jesus views family in this world. In this building, there is your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, several times over. God is conforming us into the image of his son, all of us, so that, quote, 
he, Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brothers. So building this family of God is a part of God's purpose through Christ. He's our brother. We're brothers and sisters. I think we're all at least aware that here within these walls, we are a family in Christ. But this is where it gets a little fuzzier. What happens when you leave these walls and you go out there and there are lots of other Christians, those who profess the name of Jesus Christ, attending other churches, whether in this city in Evansville or outward in America or out in other countries. There are lots of people claiming to be Christians. How are you to think about all of those people? That's most of the people. We're just a very small number of people here. We know we're family. But what do you do when you encounter others day to day out there at a different church? How are you supposed to think about them? That's the question that we are turning to because that's where our text turns us as we come to the very end of this letter of Paul to the Philippians. Remember that Paul is writing this letter from Rome. He's in prison there. He's writing it from Rome over to another city in Macedonia called Philippi to the Philippians. They're not in Rome and Paul's not in Philippi. They're at a great distance from each other. They don't live in the same city. They don't go to the same church. And yet what we find here at the end is just how Paul thinks of them and how they should think of Paul, even at a distance. Let's see that, Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 20. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint. In Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me, there in Rome, greet you. All the saints in Rome greet you in Philippi, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. On the one hand, what we're dealing with this morning is a standard formula. If you lived 2,000 years ago in the Mediterranean world and you wrote a letter, you would say things just like this. This is kind of like when you're sending an email and maybe you sign off with sincerely. And certainly the person hopes you're sincere, but they know by that it's a standard formula. This is how you end an email or a letter. And that's what we have here. These greetings... Every part, actually, the doxology at the beginning, the greetings that follow, and then his wish of grace for them. All of those are a formula. Turn to almost any of Paul's letters, go to the end of the letter, and you will find those elements in most all of them. This is a standard way of signing off a letter. But anything that falls into the hands of the Apostle Paul is not standard anymore. Just like at the beginning of his letter, when he wishes them grace and peace, to wish someone grace, Peace was very common in the ancient world as a greeting, peace to you. Yet when it fell into the hands of the Apostle Paul, it was not common anymore. No longer call common what God does not call common. So he turns it, and although he's using what's standard in the unbelieving culture, he deepens it. He deepens the social conventions. This would be kind of like if you have someone who sneezes, and you might say, bless you, and any, anyone will say that. Believer, unbeliever, doesn't matter. They'll say, bless you. But for Paul, if someone sneezes nearby, it's like he puts his hand on the shoulder and looks them in the eye and says, brother, God bless you. Saying the same thing, but one's just convention and one's not. That's what you have here in our text. So technically this is conventional. But also it's not. Paul means this very sincerely. And these things are written not just as some useless throwaway at the end of the letter, but these things are meant for our, meant for our benefit. The way that these verses benefit us specifically is that they give us a picture in the example of Paul of how Christians at a distance from each other should regard each other. Because that's what you have in Paul at Rome and those who are with him at Rome. And then he's writing to those in Philippi. They're at a great distance from each other. Most people in these churches have never met each other and never will. And yet we get a glimpse right here of how Paul says we should 
think about people who are believers, but they're at a distance. So this morning, we're not talking so much about you, we are, but we're talking about people in other churches, both here in town and across the world. What should our attitude toward them be? And to summarize what Paul is going to say by example in this passage is for any who are truly believers, even though we're at a geographical distance from them, we are together in the Father, we are together in the Son, and we are together in the Holy Spirit with them. So let's just do one of those at a time. How does this passage show you that right now you are together in the Father with believers you've never even met who are at other churches worshiping God? What we say of the Philippian and Roman churches who are specifically in view here will apply just as much to say, let's Faith Bible Church and what? Westwood Church or some unknown church on another part of the planet that we don't even know about. This would apply to how we regard churches struggling to survive in war-torn Ukraine. This is us and any gospel-preaching church in the world. Roman, Philippian, doesn't matter. How do we think of them? And Paul says we're together in the Father with them. So look at this in the doxology, verse 20. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. You may have been surprised last week that I did not include that verse because in a technical sense, yes, that goes with the passage just before. But I reserved it here and I think it's fair to do because again, it's one of those formulas that you see at the end of lots of Paul's letters. So it kind of goes together here. I think we can put it here. This is what we call a doxology. A doxology is just a statement that ascribes glory to God. Sometimes we sing the doxology here at Faith Bible Church, and almost every New Testament letter, almost every one, has a doxology in it. Often it's at the beginning of the letter or the end of the letter. Sometimes Paul just can't help it, and he throws it in right in the middle of the letter, but ascribing glory to God. In this doxology, in verse 20, there are several parts. Notice Paul notes, who should get the glory? So who's going to get the glory? That's where he starts. Who gets the glory? Double reference here to the same being, our God and Father. That's God. Then he notes, what should be ascribed to our God and Father? To our God and Father be glory. Then he gives a duration. Well, how long should this be ascribed to him? Forever and ever, into the eternal eons of the future. And then he gives that final confirmation drawn from Hebrew, amen, amen, which we end our prayers with on this basis. And it's just a way of saying what I've just said, that all glory should be to God, may that be so. But there's one piece of this doxology that stands out because you don't find it almost anywhere else. You find lots of doxologies in the New Testament, but this is one piece that's unusual to this one. Usually, in other doxologies, you will find something like, to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Multiple times you find that in doxologies. It's the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Other times, a doxology will, will speak of God with some description, such as, quote, to the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God. So the first element where we're talking about God, it's usually the God of Jesus, or it's some description of God in his majesty. When we look at this doxology here to the Philippians, the one piece that's not like other doxologies is that one word, are. O-U-R. He doesn't say the God. He doesn't say my God. He says here, and almost only here, to our God and Father be glory. To whom does the R refer? Okay, well, we know it has to refer to Paul because he's the one saying it. But of course, it's not singular, it's plural. There's more than one people being referred to. So it's Paul at least. And then you think of Paul sitting there in Rome writing this to our God. So we're going to include at least the saints who are with him there in Rome. It's 
our God and Father. But he's writing it to the Philippians with them in mind all the way through. So certainly, our is not just Paul, and it's not just Paul and the Roman Christians, but it seems to be Paul, the Roman Christians, and the Philippian Christians. It's literally everyone involved in the writing of this letter. Everyone in view here, and it's Paul with the Romans, and it's the Philippian Christians, and he specifically says, we give glory to our God and Father. My God and Father, our God and Father here in Rome, your God and Father there in Philippi, and it's the same God and Father. He reaches out one arm, pulls in the Roman saints, come here. Reaches out this one, pulls in the Philippian saints, brings everyone together into a huddle, says, do we all agree that all glory belongs to the one God and Father that we all serve? And everyone says, amen, Romans, Philippians, everyone agrees. It's the same God they serve and they want him to have glory. So the Romans and Philippians are at a distance on the map. But to Paul, they're together in the Father. Hope I'm not being too creative there. Do you see that? I mean, that R is there. This was the way, in fact, that Paul urged the Ephesians to be united with all saints by pointing out that there was only, quote, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. And he goes on to talk about how there are giftings that differ among people, but the reason that we have unity with each other here is because we're all serving the same God. You don't have some other deity that you worship as an idol over your mantelpiece, right? You and I are worshiping Yahweh together. And if you go to another church in a different state, assuming it's a true church, who are they worshiping? They're worshiping Yahweh. And if you go overseas and you get into the Baltic states and you go into a church there, who are they worshiping? They're worshiping the God of the, over to the east of that region? No, our God and Father. You go into Sub-Sahara Africa and you find there a church. Who are they worshiping? Our God and Father. We are united with them first and foremost because we are all worshiping the same God. Of course, it assumes it's the same God and we'll get to that in a second. But assuming it is the same God, we're worshiping our God and Father together. We are together in the Father this is, to Paul, one of the reasons that all the churches he visits on his missionary journeys, they're in different parts of the Mediterranean world. And I'm sure culturally, they had a lot of distinctives. Some of them are predominantly Jewish. Some of them are predominantly Roman or Gentile or Greek. And there are massive differences. Read the New Testament and you find them that lead to conflicts. But there are massive differences between these local bodies. And yet to Paul, they should have a sense of unity. Why? Paul's work isn't about these churches. His work's about God getting the worship that he deserves. And he wants this church to worship God, and this church worships God, and that church worships God. And if they do, then that line brings them together in unity. They are together in the Father. Is God the God of faith Bible church only? Is he not the God of other churches also? Yes, he is the God of other churches also. It's part of why we have unity with other believers everywhere. So if we can say the doxology and in other true churches sing the same doxology in their own language perhaps, we are united in ascribing glory to the same God. So how do you think about churches that are far away, whether that's somewhere else in this city, if it's a true church again, or that's another state in the U.S. or that's another country, how do you think about them? If it's a true church, we're worshiping the same God that they're worshiping, and that draws our heart out to them. We're going to be different culturally. We're going to have distinctives that are different, and we're going to disagree on some secondary theological issues that matter. So I'm not minimizing any of that. But Paul's starting here between the Philippian and Roman churches and saying we're united because we're worshiping the same God. That brings us then beyond that doxology, down into really the conclusion proper of this letter, where he starts giving these greetings. And I want to start at the end, verse 23, before we go back to the greetings. You'll see they're together in the Father, but they are also to be together in the Son. 
Look at this in verse 23. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. You remember that Paul wished these far-off Philippians grace at the very beginning of his letter, literally the second verse of his letter, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And what's interesting is when you get to Philippians 4, as we've seen already two times, Paul's referred to the peace of God the Father that he wished for them. He's already said the God of peace and the peace of God will be with you. And now he takes the second element of his introduction, which is the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here at the conclusion, he mentions it, grace from the Lord Jesus Christ. When you see him say, may it, he, this is a wish, may this be so. When you see him say, may the grace of Jesus Christ be with your spirit, don't make up any funky doctrines based on that. That's just his way of saying with you, you are your spirit, you are yourself, okay? So may this be with you. He's referring to the Philippian Christians. What is the grace of Christ that Paul, at the very end of this letter, sees fit to wish for the Philippian saints? I think we get a picture of it because if this is um, too confusing, ignore it, right? But maybe you understand that when we use the word of, it can mean a lot of different things. It can signify a whole lot of different relationships. And so when we see the grace of Jesus Christ, we do have to ask the question, what does the of mean? You can say the love of God and mean your love for God or God's love for you or a kind of love characterized by God. It can mean different things. So we have to ask the question, the grace of Jesus Christ, what is he talking about? The way we answer it is we look at him saying this elsewhere. And so if we look at, again, this formula... But in 2 Corinthians, in that letter, he expands on this. He says, quote, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's what we're thinking about, and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Notice when he makes that triple wish that each of those items suggests to us the of is saying, this is something that comes from this person in the Godhead. It's the grace that comes from Jesus Christ. It's the love that comes to you from the Father. It's the fellowship or unity that comes from the Holy Spirit. So if we see those three things as talking about it's from God, then when we return to our passage and he's talking about the grace of Jesus Christ, we say this is... What he's wishing for them is a grace that comes from Jesus Christ, God the Son, to the Philippian Christians. Okay, but again, what is that grace? <laughs> what exactly is Paul wanting here when he says this, if it's a deepening and not just some throwaway sentence? Which I believe it is. I think when he said in 2 Corinthians, may the love of God be with you, what does he mean? Does that mean God doesn't love you right now? No. But it means, may God's love to you be full. May it be strong. And may it be evident to the eyes of your faith. That's what I want for you. And I think we can read the same thing here. The grace of Jesus Christ. Did the Philippian Christians not have any grace from Jesus? Well, certainly they had grace from Jesus. So what's Paul saying? He wants them to experience more of the grace that comes from Jesus Christ, to be more aware of the grace that comes to them from Jesus Christ, and for that to be poured upon their heads more fully by God. Not that they don't have it at all, but he wants more of it. If you're wondering, okay, what is grace exactly? We throw that word around a lot. At essence, grace is something you get from God that's good that you don't deserve. That's the easiest way to think about it. And it's used in different ways in the Bible, but that seems to be the very essence of it. It's something free. It's God's free, unhindered affection for all who are his own. We don't deserve this affection. We don't deserve for God to love us at all. We don't deserve for Christ to feel affectionate toward us. What have we done to earn that? Nothing whatsoever. We lived the first part of all our lives in open hostility to God, rebelling against his will, 
and we're detestable in the sight of a holy God. That's what we did to deserve the love affection of God as demonstrated in the death of Jesus on our behalf. So for us to receive love or affection from God, it's grace. It's grace. It's pushed from him, not pulled to us. That's grace. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We know it. What is it? He explains that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Did you go ask at the gates of heaven, knock, 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 please, Son of God, one with the eternal being of God, creator of the universe in whom all things hold together, you who sit on the perfect exalted throne of heaven, would you please be born like a person and then die a terrible death so that I don't have to suffer for the bad things I've done? You wouldn't dare. But this is the grace of Jesus Christ, that freely of himself, he loved you. He overcame everything you put in front of him to stop his love of you. That's the immense grace of Jesus Christ. So you see that very clearly in salvation. That's the first way. This is what Romans 5 says. The free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, has abounded for many. It's a free gift. It's from his grace. You don't deserve it. It comes from him. So returning to our question, what can Paul mean specifically when he's wishing that upon the Philippians, if they're saved, they already have it. This is because for you as a Christian, grace is not just the doorkeeper who lets you in. Grace is also the usher or the attendant who walks with you. Grace continues with you in your life. Is there anything good about your life? Have you overcome any sin? Have you expressed true, genuine love to anyone else? Have you made any right sacrifices? Have you thought something true? Have you done something even artistically beautiful? Have you done anything good at all? It's grace. It's not you trusting in the arm of flesh, accomplishing for yourself, building Babylon, which I have builded for my own glory. No. This is the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ coming to you. And since the grace of Christ is something that continues with you all your life and is the very basis of all good that you do or experience as a Christian. It's very fitting that Paul, at the end of his letter, says, this is what I want most for you. The grace of Jesus be with you. I've given you exhortations. I've told you, don't be selfish. Think about others. But that's hard. But you can do it with the grace of Christ his favor, his presence, helping you to do it. I've given you promises to believe that you can abound and be abased, and it's fine because Christ strengthens you, but that's hard to remember. So here's the grace of Christ to walk with you through your trials when your bank account's empty. May that grace be with you. May you have a lot of it. May you be aware of it. Persecutions, common part of the Christian life, mistreated for the gospel, and you're supposed to rejoice? You can do it by the grace of Christ. This is put in Titus chapter 2 most clearly. You remember this verse, that passage that says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. That makes sense. Saved by grace. But then, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in the present age. What's training you? to put off sin, and to live a godly life. The same grace by which you were saved. It's still Christ in heaven freely, not because you deserve it, but freely pouring out, lavishing upon you the riches of his grace so that you can grow and thrive as a Christian. Every ounce of progress you make in the faith is an ounce of grace. Every step is a step of grace. We are not Saved, nor do we grow by the power of the flesh. It's of grace. That's why he gives this as his final word. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, Philippians. This is, if you know anything about the Apostle Paul, the very principle upon which he lived his whole life. He was formerly a persecutor of the church of God. 
He says, I'm the chief of sinners. If anyone does not deserve entrance into God's kingdom, it's me. I killed his followers. And yet the grace of God abounded to me. His whole life was grace. He learned to rest upon the grace of God. God gave him trials even as a believer and they were hard, but he came to believe that the grace of God is sufficient. It's enough for me. I will be satisfied therefore. Paul was an apostle of grace. That's the principle of his very life. If you're a Christian, that is the principle undergirding your whole life. It's this overflow of kindness and affection from Christ to you. It's your fuel. It's what gives you joy. It's what gives you life. Paul, that was true of Paul's life. And Paul is wishing it upon the Philippian Christians. More and more of that. So if you meet someone who is depending upon the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not resting in their own merits or works for salvation. Not depending upon some prayer they prayed at some time or some card they signed. But they are resting in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Fully dependent upon Him. And He's the true Christ as revealed in the Scriptures. And they're looking to Him alone for salvation. Then it doesn't matter what church you find them in. It's irrelevant. It doesn't matter where on the globe you encounter them. You are united with them. Paul lived by grace. And what does he wish for them all the way over there in Philippi? Grace. Grace for me, grace for you. And if we share in the same grace, we're in the same family. We are together in the Son. Now it's important here to point out that for Paul, Christian unity in the Son did not, did not extend to every person who called themselves a Christian. We really wish it wasn't so, and we're not trying to be hypercritical, but there are many churches which are churches, and by definition, Christian. And yet, the gospel is not preached or believed in these places. There's often can be a heretical teaching or deficient teaching. It's what Paul said to the Galatians, you are forsaking the grace of Christ. You're forsaking him for another gospel. And that, through the work of the devil, is common. We're not saying we have a unity in that way because in that sense, we're not together in the sun because they have a different sun. You may be aware that the ecumenical movement, which has many branches, but the idea of the ecumenical movement in many of its forms is to bring together those who have completely different concepts of who God is, of who Christ is, of what the Bible is, and to say, well, let's just come around the campfire singing Kumbaya and hold hands because we have at least some general idea of God being God. Everybody here likes the word Jesus, and therefore, we should have a sense of unity. But the one person you'll never find around that campfire is the Apostle Paul, or really any of the apostles, nor Jesus himself. We're not speaking this morning of an empty sort of unity where you can leave this building, go literally into any place calling itself a church, and you are 100% united with everyone there. That's not what we're talking about. That's not what the New Testament talks about whatsoever. You can't, some people in the ecumenical movement would argue even that any other religious system that has some concept of God, so be that Muslim or Hindu or Buddhist or anything, although Buddhist arguably doesn't, Hindu, Muslim, we're all just going up a mountain, as a local Hindu told me this one time, we're all just going up a mountain on different sides, but all the roads lead to the peak where God is. That's not true. In contrast, hear the clear words of the Apostle John, which we're going to see in our next book, 1 John, quote, no one who denies the Son has the Father. To be together with another church out there or a believer out there, we have to be together in the actual Son. And when John says no one who denies the Son has the Father, he is not talking about people who deny that Jesus ever existed, nor even that he was the Son of God. He's talking about, as we'll see, early Gnostics who redefined who Jesus was. They simply made him someone who was here, but he was a spiritual being there was no incarnation. He wasn't born of the Virgin Mary. He didn't physically die upon the cross himself. So they changed. It's still Jesus to them. It's still the Son of God. So we should have unity, right? But they changed who he is. And John says they're denying the Son. And if they deny the Son, they don't have God. 
and we don't have a unity with them. So this morning, when we're talking about unity with churches out there, we're not talking about you feeling a unity, for example, with Mormons. Even though we love Mormons and want them to know the Lord, the Mormons have a different Lord. They use language that we're familiar with, so it gets tricky. But almost every word they use, from grace to God to Jesus to the Holy Spirit, has been redefined and reinterpreted in heretical and dangerous ways. They don't have the Son. That's why we're not together in the Son with Mormons. To Mormons, Jesus is the first spirit child of this being God, and he's not even the only God there is. He became a God. And he had a spirit child, Jesus, and then he had other spirit children. That's not the Jesus you're worshiping, is it? That's not the Jesus I worship. That's a different son. So when Paul wishes the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ upon that church over there, it's assuming that they have the Lord Jesus Christ over there. This is not an empty sort of unity. There are so many secondary points of doctrine about which we Christians can disagree and still be together in the Son in some sense. They're important points of doctrine, but secondary in the sense that the gospel doesn't rise or fall with it. But there are central points of doctrine, and most of them have to do with who Jesus is and what he came to accomplish. And if that's compromised, we're not together in the Son. They're our mission field. Mormons are not together with us in unity. They're the mission field that we're bringing the gospel to. You should think of any fellowship of believers anywhere in the world with a true, not a perfect, but a true doctrine of Christ as your family. If they have the Son, we are together in the Son. This brings us now to our final point. Together in the Father, any church out there has the Father, we're together. If any church out there has the Son, we're together. We might not always work together if there's secondary differences that are strong, and that's, that's fine. Together in the Lord. Together in the Holy Spirit. That's our third point here. Verses 22 and 23 as we close. Paul says, Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. Now listen, I grant that the Father and the Son are explicitly mentioned in this passage, but you do not see the Holy Spirit. You're right, but look, wasn't it the Apostle Paul's method to be finding the Trinity pretty much everywhere? <laughs> These triadic passages show up all the time. It's hard to think of the Father and Son and not think of the Holy Spirit. And I think there's justification with these greetings to attach it specifically to the work of the Holy Spirit. Because look what's happening here. There's a greeting. What does that signify? It's not empty. It's showing a unity. You greet someone who you know. You greet them. This is a friend. Give you a hug. We're greeting you. There was a kiss of love in the early church. We're not going to practice that. But that was a way of showing affection. So here you have a sense of unity between these churches. And where does our unity among churches come from? It comes from the Holy Spirit. You also have here, when he's referring to the Christians, he calls them once brothers, but two times he calls them saints. Saint just means holy ones. And where does our holiness come from? Yes, the gospel, it's imputed to us. But we're also saints because of our lifestyle, because we're being changed to be holy in practice. And where does that come from? It comes from the Holy Spirit. And lastly, when he mentions, especially those of Caesar's household, why say that? Why even say that? It's supposed to be an encouragement. And where does our encouragement come from as Christians? comes from the Holy Spirit. Together in the Holy Spirit. So look here at these greetings and you'll see this. First, look at this element of unity in the greetings. Like I said, Paul says, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. He's not telling someone specifically to go do that. He's saying, greet yourselves. He's saying, I greet all of you. Every single one of you, I greet. The unity that the Spirit brings about among believers, it's not 
selective. And this is a hard point because, look, some people in here and out there you really like, and some you don't like so much. But see, if they're believers, Paul said, greet every saint, every saint. We have a unity in the Spirit with every Christian in this world. And that includes the Christians who are thriving and doing well and will be joyful relationships for you. But that also includes those Christians who are sinning and struggling with sin and sucking things in and are difficult or in a hard place or have a lot of needs. Doesn't matter. Paul doesn't say, have them stand over there and I want to greet all of you. <laughs> he says, greet every saint. And you remember that Paul had said in Rome there were some who were preaching the gospel to spite him. So they're not getting along, but it's the same gospel. So I think Paul in some sense could apply this over there. I still greet them. <laughs> greet every. You don't get to be selective and just greet the saints you want to greet. He says, greet every saint for me. In, but notice, in Christ Jesus. They have to be believers there at Philippi. Then he expands the circle. He says, the brothers who are with me greet you. So here's Paul. I'm greeting all of you far over there. Then he expands the circle. The brothers who are immediately with me, whoever they may be, perhaps attending to him while he is in prison. He says, they greet you. Many of these brothers probably never met the Philippians probably didn't know any of them. Maybe just Epaphroditus who had come, and yet they send their greetings also. Where does that kind of unity come from? You might not know a single Ukrainian believer, but you feel a love for Ukrainian believers. Where's this coming from? The Holy Spirit. We are together with them in the Holy Spirit. And then finally, he expands it all the way out. All the saints greet you, meaning all the saints in Rome, not just the ones with me, but this whole city, every believer here, we are greeting you. The Spirit alone, as I said, is also the one producing this holiness in them. That's why they are saints, holy ones. The Spirit of God applies redemption. Positionally, they are holy in the sight of God. But even their lifestyle, they are rightly dubbed saints. Our lifestyles, not perfect, but we should live up to the title saints. There are some who will claim to be Christian and have correct doctrine in other churches, but Paul makes it very clear, if you encounter any so-called brother or sister, he says so-called, who lives in immorality or in sin unrepentantly, who lives just like an unbeliever, he says, take them out of the church. We don't have fellowship with them. So even here, we're talking about fellowship with the saints, not perfect people. We're talking about sinning saints, but there are those who live in repentance. And if you encounter them anywhere, you have a unity in the spirit with them. And lastly here, this encouragement, especially those of Caesar's household. It's meant to be an encouragement to the Philippian Christians because Rome was the center of the world at that time. And there in the belly of the beast, which would produce so many foul gases of persecution in the centuries that followed, right there in the heart of it, he says, even in Caesar's own household, you should know there are brothers and sisters there. Maybe they were already Christians before Paul came, or maybe he led them to the Lord. Maybe they were slaves in the household. Maybe they were of some standing. Doesn't matter. He wants them to know that in the Holy Spirit, there is a unity, even in Caesar's own household believers who are there and you yourself should feel the same kind of unity in the belly of the beast Do you feel a unity here we are in the midwest i don't know about you but i'm very grateful that in a context quite different from ours there are healthy churches in new york city and they don't look like this church <laughs> but they are healthy churches that love the gospel love god and are advancing the cause there you love Capitol Hill Baptist Church that's thriving there in Washington, D.C. in the belly of the beast? Looks different than here in some ways, but we have a unity with them. In Caesar's own household, what an encouragement. Brothers and sisters, I hope that the Holy Spirit has encouraged you through this letter to the Philippians. These are believers just like you and me. And Paul greets them, has a unity with them, and we are called to have a unity with others. Who are your people? Your people 
are not a small collection of believers in the Midwest, in Evansville, Indiana. Your people is the whole family of God. Here and anywhere that you find those with which you have a unity in the Father, a unity in the Son, and a unity in the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Let's pray. Oh God, thank you for adopting us into your family. And it is so expansive to our minds when we sometimes get sucked in within ourselves and so fixated on this moment and this place. It is so expansive and healthy for us to open a window and look out and see the vast expanses here and there. You have your people. Many are false believers. We grieve and desire that to change. But you have your people. The 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal and they are spread across the world. And they are worshiping you today here in the United States, here in Evansville and other churches. They are worshiping you today in the 1040 window where they are most likely hiding or persecuted. They are worshiping you today across the continent of Africa. They are worshiping you up in Tibetan mountains, places few people visit. There they know the name of Jesus and there they worship you. Lord, thank you. These are our brothers and our sisters your holy ones in whom is all our delight, and we look forward to the day when with one voice we will join with them, though in different languages, and ascribe all glory and worship and praise to you and to the Lamb who sits upon the throne. Worthy is he to receive all of this. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.